Welcome back everybody to the Meeple Marathon and our continued coverage of Ultra Quest. Uh, today we're going to be doing a setup and how to play video. So let's go ahead and get this out of the way. Um, this is the alternate map. Uh, I just haven't had a chance to play on it yet so I thought why not. Uh, otherwise it is exactly the same to my knowledge, room placement and all that stuff, it just has a different look and feel to it. It's a little more ominous, but in my opinion, the shadow spaces where the threat, the minions spawn, is, are, is more obvious on this um, map. But anyways, uh, nothing changes between this and the main map. So, um, <clears throat> Ultra Quest is part of Blacklist Games' modular deck system, which means that setup is actually quite easy for the game. Uh, it's essentially deciding, um, you know, who you want to play, who you want to play against, and what quest you want to play. And you pull out various decks of cards, uh, you shuffle them up, and you get going. Some of them will have a few setup instructions, but they're very minor. So, uh, right off the bat, let's go ahead and start with who did we want to play as. Uh, for this playthrough, I'm going to be playing as Layson Pines. He is one of the Kickstarter exclusive characters that actually can turn himself into a werewolf. So he's the only character in the game that has a double-sided card. Uh, he also comes with a reference card. So when you're setting up your hero, what you're going to do is find obviously your character card, then your two pieces uh, of starting equipment. You can see that the starting equipment has the much lighter color down here along the banner compared to all the other cards which have that brownish color to them. So you're gonna pull all those out. Uh, I've already given this, uh, given all these decks a pretty good shuffle, but essentially you will shuffle it. You would create a discard pile, and then you would uh, set up your character with their starting equipment, something like this. You wanna make sure you have space up above you in order to place your threat cards. So when the minions come out, they're gonna be placed in somebody's threat area uh, if you're playing solo, then obviously they're all going to go into your threat area. Obviously, I would normally put this off the board, but just for the purposes of setup, uh, I'm just putting here, them here on the board. Next, you would want to decide who or what, who you want to fight against or what quest you want to do. So, let's keep it simple here. We want to, in keeping with the theme, I'm going to play against the Lunarin and Broderick Heston. Uh, these guys all kind of fit into the you know, same story arc. So, um, you know, it makes sense for them to play against each other, but I could have played against the Frox and had Gert as my villain. It really doesn't matter. Um, the modular deck system allows you to stick in whichever uh, threat deck you want and whichever villain you want. So I just uh, haven't had a chance to play these decks yet. So I thought, why not stick with the theme? So let's start with the threat deck. These are your minions. You're gonna, every time you reveal a room, you're going to draw one of these cards. Um, so, you're always gonna look for this one card. Uh, it's got the same back, but you can see that it has this one symbol for threat tokens. Threat tokens are one of the uh, few tokens in the game that changes, the rules change depending on your threat deck. So you, basically what you wanna do is, you know, probably wanna set this off to the side give your threat deck a shuffle, and then you put it next to it. All right, you're gonna do the same thing for Broderick Heston here. Flip him over, you can see here's Broderick Heston's card. On the back side is a brief description, and this is what you're actually gonna play with sitting up. Until Broderick Heston is revealed, you're gonna use this activate and this rune power down here. This one actually happens to have a small setup instruction, so it says find the black wolf card, place it off to the side. So we're gonna do that and place its miniature on it. Then the rest of these cards, we are gonna shuffle up and this creates the villain deck. So you've now created a threat deck to draw from and a villain deck to draw from. Um, at some point I will go find the miniature for that guy and set him on top. I don't need the Broderick Heston miniature yet because he doesn't get revealed to the end of the game. Um, some people recommend you go ahead and pull out all you all your Lunarin uh, miniatures and have them sitting out and go ahead and put the uh, you know plastic base rings on them. I don't do that. 
um, I simply pull out one of each. And if I need more than one, I can just reach into the box and grab them. I'll throw the rubber rings on as they, as they come out. Uh, the last thing we need to cover is what quest are we going to do? So, uh, also from the stretch goal box, we're going to try pillaging the vault. Uh, again, all these cards look the same on the back, but we want to look for the one that's double-sided. This one's going to have a brief description, and then it's going to have the setup. So you can see here for setup, we're going to move each copy of backpack from the quest deck and place one copy in each hero's play area. Remove the rest from the game. Okay, so just setting that down to the side, you can see, oh, there we go. There are four backpack cards. I'm playing by myself, so I will add this to Layson's uh, essentially um, setup area. These will go back in the box. Then... If we look back at our setup here, it says um, when the building feature, when building the feature deck, shuffle together the altar found card and two other feature cards and place them at the bottom of the feature deck. Okay, that's pretty standard. So here we have our altar deck. Um, it doesn't matter. I guess maybe there might be some quests where it matters what altar you have, but I'm just going to give this a shuffle. I'm going to pick one, set that off to the side, and I'm going to make sure that this altar found feature card is um, on the bottom two of the feature deck. So I'll go ahead and give the feature deck a quick shuffle here. I will pick two cards. So one, two. I will mix these up now. So we know that the altar is not going to be found until the you know, latter third of the game. It could be the very last feature we find. It could be that very top card. Then the feature deck always contains seven cards. Uh, no matter what quest you're playing, at least as of now, um, all quests have seven feature cards, which is essentially like seven rooms you're revealing. So we've got three in there now. We need four more. We'll just take the top four since we already shuffled this up. Place those there. The rest of these can go back in the box along with uh, the rest of the altar deck. We only need our one altar card here. And so our feature deck needs to just go off somewhere where we can draw from it. Same thing with the lurker deck. We're gonna need that off to the side somewhere and the search deck shuffled up, placed off to the side. All right, let's go back to our quest deck here and just go through the rest of the setup. So we've created the feature deck. This says remove each looting card from the quest deck and shuffle them together to create a looting deck. Set the deck near the quest area, shuffle the quest deck and flip this card over. Okay, then essentially it's giving us what our win conditions are. So our win conditions are needing four or more quest tokens on your backpack uh, and back on the stairs. We have pillaged the vault. Uh, it also is going to tell us what happens when we get to the quest phase, how the quest is going to activate. So I'm going to place this down here. I'm going to pull out all of the looting cards. So I'm going to shuffle these up and create a looting deck. Now you do need to keep in mind that these have the same back as the rest of the quest deck. You can see the back is the same. And you're going to shuffle up the quest deck and set it down too. So try not to get those mixed up. Um, lots of quests do this. I'm not really sure why they didn't make the backs slightly different colors, but uh, there you go. <clears throat> so just a little bit of advice. When you're setting up the threat, villain, and quest deck, um, you usually aren't going to need any extra room to line cards up past the threat deck. They're almost always going to come out and go into your threat area. Same thing with the villain deck. Most of them are events. Occasionally there's one or two ongoing cards, so you might need space for one or two more cards after this. The quest deck, however, is where you're going to place the feature cards as they become revealed. So make sure you have room to line cards up to the right of where your quest pile is. Um, so just keep that in mind. Obviously, as I'm setting up here, this is not where I would normally set cards up, but just make sure you have room to give yourself space, or I guess you could go down, um, but you're, you're always activating cards from left to right. So you could do top to bottom, but um, left to right is what they call for in the instructions. <clears throat> you're going to go ahead then and find your 
figure out which altar. So I randomly drew the quaking altar. I don't need my altar miniature yet. Again, that's gonna appear near the end of the game, but the altar is gonna activate every quest phase. It's so powerful that no matter where we are in the dungeon, it's affecting us in, in some way. All right, so we have pretty much now gotten all of our cards ready, and that's the majority of the setup is preparing your decks. Then you're gonna choose, or not choose, you're gonna take the stair tile, which is the only feature that is simply just a cardboard token, and you're going to choose a room that it's gonna go in. So I could stick it here, I could stick it here, I could stick it over here. Uh, let's just say, for example's sake, we'll put it here. Since it's a four space feature, it's gonna cover up all four of those and go right in the middle of the room. Then you'll take your hero figure, place it on any one of those four spaces, let's say, here, because I'm going to want to go here first. Prepare your dice pools. So your hero dice, you just want to have off to the side somewhere, but you also want to go ahead and roll out your altar pool. If you happen to have the Kickstarter um, exclusive colored dice, make sure you only use one set of altar dice, either the black and white or the colored. Don't use both. There should only be five dice in the altar pool. So we'll roll these out and then these essentially just need to be parked somewhere until you manipulate them and need to be rolled again. Um, last thing is go ahead and grab you three action point markers. These are not required but they do help you keep track um, as you're going through whether you've done an action or not. So you just flip them over. I've done one action, two action. Now I've done three actions and then when you go back through again one, two, three. That's really all they're there for. Um, otherwise, they're completely optional. And then just make sure you have the rest of your tokens off to the side somewhere, easily available. At this point, you have set up for a game of Alter Quest. Okay, so now that we have the game all set up, let's go through um, essentially the basics of a turn um, or a round are the hero turn. So the heroes, or in this case, we're playing solo, the hero gets to take three actions. And then we have the threat turn, the villain turn, and the quest turn. Uh, so let's start with the hero turn. Your uh, options for actions uh, are, are pretty straightforward, but let's go ahead and cover them now. So you can move. So that would simply be one, two, three, or you could even go one, two, open up a door, and then three. Um, revealing a room, which we will talk about uh, in a little bit, does not cost an action. Uh, it's like a free action. You just have to be in a door space. So that's, for example, this one or this one. One of the two spaces directly orthogonal to the door graphic on the map. Um, you could not open a door or reveal a room from here here or here or here only these two spaces essentially so if you are moving and say you go one two you can interrupt your movement only to reveal a room um, there may be a card or two out there that gives you instructions of when you can interrupt your movement but otherwise you cannot say move to attack and then move one to uh, continue your action and all heroes get a basement uh, or base of three movement three spaces when you take a move action so that's one action you can take the next one is a card action and that's a lot of your actions are going to be either taking an action on your card for example here uh, Layson's ranger bow has the keyword action here so we're going to take an attack and the test that we're going to do to attack is going to be using i believe that's agility so you can see the colors and the little icon match. And so we get to take a two dice attack and every success that we get is a hit on the enemy. Now we're gonna talk about uh, defense and boosting your rolls and things like that in a little bit, but just for the basis of what actions you can take, this is considered a card action. Now your starting equipment is always in front of you and you can always have this action available to you. You do not exhaust the card to take this attack action. You would, however, exhaust the card if you used a wind rune in the altar pool to deal one damage to an enemy within range. But 
an exhausted card does not keep you from using the action on the card. It only keeps you from using the exhaust keyword again. So you can see for the Crescent of Loon here, his trinket, you could either exhaust for a basic exhaust, or if you have the proper rune, you can exhaust, um, you know, you might consider that a better exhaustion uh, opportunity. But either way, once you pick one of these two, the card is exhausted and it can't be used again. Um, or there are the cards in your hand. So you may have any number of cards in your hand. Uh, you start the game with four. You don't have to play one out of your hand during your turn, and then you always get to draw one at the end of your turn. Or you could play three out of your hand as your three actions. So the amount of cards in your hand is really going to vary. Um, but just for as a, an example here, we have Hunter's Reach, which you can see the keyword here is action. This one says action elf, simply because Lason Pines has certain cards that he can use when he's an elf and certain cards that he can use when he's a werewolf. Either way, playing this card out of your hand and conducting this, um, going through this text here would be considered an action, a card action. If you happen to have the proper rune in the altar pool, in this case fire, you can then do the bottom action in addition to the top action. It's like a bonus. Either way, you are discarding this card at the, uh, the end of that action. Um, <clears throat> there are cards that you can play that have the keyword ongoing. Now you can see this is a werewolf card, so technically Lace and Pines as a elf wouldn't be able to play it, but see this keyword ongoing here? You can play this card as an action, but then the ongoing means that it's gonna sit in front of you, um, similar to like where the backpack is here. You would put it here in front of you, and that means you always have the exhaust to use and you would exhaust it and you know at the start of your next turn you would get it back or you can use the card which means discard get rid of it to use this somewhat better benefit but use it once and that card disappears um the all there there's two other types of cards you might see in your hand this one is a reaction card so this is one you can actually use um, in different times. Sometimes it may be when a minion is attacking you and dealing damage or someone else is being attacked. Uh, this one happens to be anytime you resolve the action on Wolf Claws, which if we flip Lace and Pines' card over here, we can see that here's Wolf Claws. So we could use the attack action. Then we can play this card for free. So reactions do not use up an action. And the last card type I want to point out are feet cards. So you can see the keyword here is feet, not action. That makes a difference because feats are free actions, essentially. You can play a feet card out of your hand and complete the text just like an action card. Do the bottom part if the rune is available, just like on an action card, but this does not cost an action. Um, so that is basically card actions in a nutshell. Now, uh, the next thing that you may see is uh, interact. So I know this is not on the right space, but just for the purposes of teaching, normally it would sit, normally when you place a feature, you look for these four arrows down here in the corner and you place a single one like this chest on the kind of funky arrow, the one that's unique. If it's a two space feature on the two white ones and a four space feature would take up all four. So, but for the purposes of, um, you know, showing off what action is, I'm gonna move it a little closer. So an interact, interact action would be um, if you are adjacent. So you can be diagonally adjacent to this card and, um, you know, that's not a, it's not a very good example. I pulled out this, but I realized I don't have that card in my deck right now, but you can see here that there is an interact uh, keyword on this card. So if this were the crates feature, let's just pretend for a minute that this is the crates feature. I am adjacent to it. I can spend an action to interact, which in this case would be search using my yellow um, stat, which for Lace and Pines would be two dice and, um, and then I may discard one supply to draw one search card. 
um, and a search action, you're going to get search cards. So you can actually get multiple search cards from uh, the crates. So that's interact. Essentially, you have to be next to an object, usually a feature that has the keyword interact on its card, and then you can interact with it. Um, okay, technically on this list here is the next play and action card, which I've already covered um, as a card action. You can also spend an action to draw a card. So if you literally have no good options in your opinion, and you know there's a card in your deck that could possibly help, you can spend one action to draw a card. You can also spend one action to rest, but in order to rest, you have to have supply. This is the example of a supply token. These are shared tokens among um, your entire party. So if you're playing with multiple people, anytime anybody gains a supply token, it's shared amongst you all. And you can spend one of these as an action to heal two damage, that's the rest. And the last thing you can do is channel. Channel allows you to choose one altar die and turn it to the face of your choice. So say I wanted water so that somebody else in my party could use it. And you also gain a focus token, which looks like this. So kind of a double benefit for channeling, but you don't really take any action. You're not moving, you're not doing anything else. You're just setting things up for a better turn for either yourself or someone else. Um, those are all of the possible actions that a hero can take on their turn. Once you have taken your three actions, you will then draw a card and you know essentially everyone else goes, all the other heroes go. And then once everybody has taken their three actions, you start the threat phase. So let's kind of get these out of here uh, and just continue to go along in, in a chronological order here. The threat phase is simply drawing or activating um, any cards in your threat area. So this is a great time to talk about revealing a room. So what happens when you reveal a room? Say you come here and you wanna reveal this room, this big room here. The first thing you do is you place the door down. The next thing you do, you're gonna draw a feature card. In this example, let's say I drew the chest and I put it on its marked space. Then what you're gonna do is draw a quest card. So in this instance, uh, it would be from the Pillaging the Vault card, and I'm not gonna flip those over just for spoiler reasons, so. But uh, the quest card may attach to the feature, or it may um, you know, give you an event you have to deal with, whatever it may be. No matter what though, the feature card that you drew is gonna go into your quest row. Because when it comes turn to the quest to have a turn, you're going to activate that feature. Um, so you have opened the door, you've revealed a feature, you have revealed a quest card. The last thing you're going to do is reveal one threat card per party member. Even if, say, you're playing with four players and two of them went off the other direction, you're still going to reveal four threat cards. So in this case, there's only me, so I'm just going to reveal one threat card. So here is a minion. There can be events, there can be traps, and there can be minions in the threat deck. In this case, I would take a moon child. Um, if I wanted to, I could place the blue uh, rubber ring on the bottom. So in case another moon child came out, I could keep them, uh, tell them apart. I know that she's getting a blue ring because of this gem in the middle. And all of her, you know, basic stats here are on the card. And she goes into my threat area since I drew the card. When you're playing multiplayer, each person essentially draws a card from the threat deck. One person should not draw all of them. Um, and then it goes into your threat area because there are some cards that mention... Uh, any minions in your threat area specifically. So you need to keep the minions and traps and everything in people's separate threat areas. Um, so uh, when you reveal a room, the shadow space is off camera in this room, but this here is an example of a shadow space. You can see that it's um, like, looks like a hole in the floor. This is where the minion would spawn in this particular room if I revealed this room. 
each room has one space like this. If you're revealing more than one minion, say two, you simply put them adjacent and just start filling in around it. That is revealing a room. So that's a very important step. And that's how more threat ends up on the board. That's also how you advance the quest. And that's how features end up on the board. So revealing a room obviously is how you progress the story and progress the game. So let's go back to the threat turn. So now that we actually have a card in our threat area, normally this would be above our cards, but for this example, it's, it's sitting below, but we're gonna call this our threat area. Um, you simply activate cards from left to right and you add cards um, you know, to your threat area from left to right. And that does matter sometimes. The order in which you activate the cards sometimes matter. And it's your choice who, when you're playing multiplayer, whose threat area you activate first. So look around because there may be somebody's threat area you want to get out of the way first um, because someone else may have a trap that's going to boost the stats of a minion in front of you or, or something like that. So you want to get that minion out of the way and then the trap last. Anyways, <clears throat> when you are looking at a minion card, you are you know looking at several statistics here. This is their natural defense. So no matter how many successful hits you put on her, she's already always gonna subtract one. Uh, this is her health. So this is how many times you would need to hit her, taking into account her armor, how many times, how many hit points you would need to put on her in order to remove her from the game. This is how many points of movement she has. So she can move up to four, and this is her range. So you, can, you can't really see it, but if you look at her miniature, she actually is holding a crossbow there. So she is a ranged character. She can shoot at you from five spaces away, which is pretty good. And last but not least, you have some text here. So when she activates, you read out and do the activate text. So for her, it would be engage, then inflict five. Uh, if unable to, she's gonna engage again and gain one armor token. So engage is, is pretty standard terminology for a dungeon crawler. That means she's going to advance towards the nearest hero and she's gonna get within five and stop. Um, she can move up to four times to get within five range. She doesn't wanna get closer really. She's gonna use her range. There's no like, this isn't like Descent or Imperial Assault where you actually have to roll for the range. She just always has five range. So engaging just means getting into a position where you can attack. For some minions that has to be adjacent because they have no range, they're melee characters. Inflict is then they are trying to inflict damage on you, five. But the reason it's in green is because Layson can use his agility statistic, which is two, to roll defense against it. Any successes he gets on a two die roll would uh, lower that inflict five. Say he gets two successes, it's now an inflict three. He's gonna take three damage. You can see that Layson here has zero natural defense. So it would definitely be three unless he had some armor tokens. Whereas if I rolled three against her, it's actually only gonna take, she's only gonna take two damage. So in this instance, if she goes to engage, she moves four and she's still say six spaces away, she cannot inflict. So if unable, she engages again, she'll move four spaces closer and gain one armor token. So she actually wouldn't attack if she moves twice. Last thing is, is if there is a rune that matches the rune she's looking for, which in this case is a shadow rune in the altar pool, she will use it just like a hero does. You'll have to roll it out. It could turn back into something, but then you have to deal with this bottom text too. If there's no shadow rune in the altar pool, then you skip this. So that's an example of a threat turn. Basically, you go through all the minions and all the traps that are sitting in people's threat area. Then we go to the villain turn. Now the villain should always have their card, which is actually their actual character card on the back side. But on the front side is, you know, the background, the setup instructions, and then you can see the activate ability. So for Broderick Heston here, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's basically healing the Black Wolf if the Black Wolf's figure is on its card. 
and if the shadow rune's there, the black wolf heals uh, one per player damage. So he's really not that doing that much to you. He's healing up his, his wolf buff. <coughs> but that card's always there. So you're always going to activate uh, that card, followed by drawing a card from um, the villain deck. So for example, this one is an event. So you would go through the event top to bottom. Again, if there's a rune symbol next to uh, an action, you only take that action if the runes exist in the altar pool. If not, then you skip it. If at any point in time you go to draw a villain card and there is not one, you cannot draw, the draw pool is empty, that is when the villain spawns. You would take their card that is their setup card, you would flip it over, and you would put their uh, miniature in the shadow space of the room that contains the most heroes. So, um, usually most people are around the same room, but that's how the villain enters the game. Otherwise, you're simply dealing with a villain card. They're usually events, you know, you just deal with the card and then the card discards. Occasionally, you can have cards that become ongoing. They sit out and you have to deal with them every turn too. The last part of this um, closeout phase, react phase, is the quest turn. So the first thing you'll do is look at the quest card. On the front side here was the setup and on the back side it has activate. So essentially just this entire time you're looking for the activate keyword. Uh, you're activating this card, you're gonna do what it says, and then again you go left to right moving down the line. This is where you're gonna find your altar card. So you can see the altar card has an activate keyword. It also has a rune symbol it's looking for. Same thing with the feature. You would then move down and say, all right, this is the next feature. Activate a hero adjacent. If there's nobody adjacent, then you just move on. But again, you're looking for that activate keyword there. Once you have gone through the threat, villain, and quest turn, you go back to the next hero turn. And really you're only, you know, you don't draw one villain card per player. You only draw one, period, no matter how many players you're playing. The only thing that really multiplies with the players is who's in their threat area. And that happens when you reveal a room. So more threat will be added into each room based on your player count. But beyond that, you're only uh, activating one villain card and you're only going through the quest row one time. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, each quest is different. Um, so how you are being able to put quest tokens on things is different. In this case, uh, we're utilizing the backpack and, and getting quest tokens from features and things like that. Um, so make sure you pay attention to the quest rules because that's what makes this game unique is that the quests and the heroes, everything's unique, but the quests certainly are unique. You're always revealing a room the same way, adding features the same way, and adding threat the same way, but uh, beyond that, everything is very different. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, if you ever gain threat tokens, each threat deck uses threat tokens differently, so you would want to look at the um, reference card for the threat deck. This is an example of a threat token. Um, this is an example of an armor token. So if you're ever told to gain armor, this is, um, these could be discarded to essentially remove one hit from an attack. Minions can have armor, villains can have armor, heroes can have armor. So if you're attacking a villain, I mean, or a minion, either one, you have to remove armor tokens before you can place damage on them. Um, what other tokens do we have here? This is a search token. Search tokens are placed onto feature cards after you search them. So the first time you search a feature card, for example, uh, the garbage heap here, you can see you're using the, your orange stat to interact with the garbage heap and search it. The first time you search in the garbage heap, it's pretty straightforward. Any, if, as long as you get one success, you're gonna gain a search card, which you know comes from this deck here. You take the top card and it's yours. Um, and then every success beyond the first one, you gain a supply token. 
pretty simple. But then you take a search token and you put it on this card. The garbage heap has already been searched once. Well, just like with anything, once one person has rummaged through the garbage heap, there's less stuff in it. So if another person or you yourself were to come back and try and search the garbage heap again, it becomes a little harder. You roll out your dice. The first success is canceled out by this search token. So technically your second success is when you get to draw a search card and then every success after that. But now you've searched it two times. Well, at this point, if you roll dice, your first two successes are canceled. This keeps you from being able to just sit next to a feature um, for a good part of the game and just sit there and keep searching and searching and searching until you get the perfect card that you want. Um, what else is there to explain? Um, that's pretty much it. Um, like we said, the, you know, the dice, the cards and the dice are a very important part of the game. So we've already taken a look at the altar dice. These are pretty straightforward. So you roll those out anytime you use them. Um, anytime you use a specific rune, you roll out the dice anew and whatever it's up is that's what's now active in the room. Now these are your action dice. These are the ones you're going to be rolling a lot. And you can see there are several symbols on here. Here's just an example of the four symbols. So this one right here is a basic success. That's like one hit on the villain or one success towards a search, whatever it may be. This one is a focus. You either can gain a focus by getting this roll. You add this to your hand or you can spend a focus if you already have one in your possession to turn this into a success. So to, to boost your roll. Um, this one is both a success and a focus. So you not only would get a, your third success, but you would gain a focus token in this instance. And this is a critical roll. This one counts as a success, but allows you to roll in another die. And so say for example, and this can happen, say this was your roll. Say you get a four die roll and this is your first roll. You actually will get to roll in three more dice. So you're never out of a fight in this game with the critical, I like to call them exploding dice explosions. Um, you can just sometimes keep rolling and even a two dice attack has the potential to turn into an infinite number of damage. Um, but obviously you're gonna have to get lucky. Um, in terms of uh, focus tokens, say for example, this was your roll and you have no focus tokens on hand and you need two successes, but this is your roll. Unfortunately, you have failed. Your only option if you don't have a focus to spend at the beginning of the turn is to take two focus here. You cannot, uh, there's one success, you cannot take a focus to gain a focus token and then immediately turn around and spend that focus to turn that into a success. Essentially, you have to resolve the roll first before gaining focus tokens, if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. I don't really know any other better way to explain it. And you can carry a maximum of five focus tokens um, on your person, on your hero. And whether you spend focus or gain focus is entirely up to you. So you could be doing a search action and you could have rolled your one success to gain the search card, one success to gain a supply, and then a focus. You could spend a focus to get a second supply because maybe you feel like you need them. Or you could say, no, I'd rather have another focus on hand and gain the focus. So that's always up to you. Last thing you can do to boost your rolls on any test is to spend a supply, remember those are shared, to add, say you have a starting uh, attack of three dice, adding or using a supply will simply give you the ability to add a dice to the attack. And to my knowledge, you can only do this once. You can't say, ooh, I'm gonna add three supply to add three dice. You can only spend one supply on a particular test to add in a die. And that's pretty much it. Um, again, you just need to pay attention to the quest rules and the specific setup and how you win on the quest card to know how to actually win the game because it varies depending on your quest. But essentially, you're going to spend your turns moving around, attacking minions, 
playing cards out of your hand, revealing rooms, until you have found the altar and, if needs be, defeated the villain or done whatever tasks you need to to succeed. Um, just as a reminder, the altar card sits out in the quest row the whole game, but you don't actually put the altar feature out. For example, this is the one in the core box. You don't put it out on the game board until you have revealed the altar is found card, which we know we shuffled in and placed at the bottom uh, in the, within the bottom three cards of the feature deck. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Hopefully um, some people can get some use out of this. The rule book is okay, but it's not great. Um, and I know that certainly having some examples uh, can be helpful sometimes. Uh, I think I covered everything that was in, oh, there's one other thing. And unfortunately I didn't think about this until the very end, um, but there are two keywords that you need to pay attention to. And let me see if I can find a card here. There's actually none in that. Let's see, uh, here we go. So this is a great card example. You can see that this one has two keywords, inflict and resist. Inflict, you have to think of it thematically as they are inflicting direct damage on you. So when you are rolling defense against an inflict action, you can, your natural defense comes into play. In the werewolf's example, it's one, but also you can spend defense tokens uh, to cancel out um, hits. Whereas resist, resist is more, um, you know, non-physical trauma. If you think about it that way, uh, it can be various things. And depending on the threat deck, the theme may change. For example, the frocks or the raglanders, it's more like poison or noxious gas and things like that, that it's not physical. You can't block it with a shield, but you have to resist it or you take damage. So resisting, you only can block it out by your actual rolls. The actual successes you get on a roll, you cannot use shield tokens or your base shield stat against a resist action. So that was one of the very confused, most confusing things for me in particular uh, when I first started playing the game. So hopefully this has been helpful for some of you. Um, stay tuned. I'm going to be putting out a tips and tricks, uh, kind of a, I guess you could say tips and tricks, more of a uh, 10 things I wish I had known when I first started playing video very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and please consider subscribing to the channel. That's uh, the biggest help you guys can give me um, as uh, say, saying thanks for producing these videos is subscribing to the channel. So once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.